Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to SNAP Inc.'s first quarter 2019 earnings conference call. At this time, participants will be in a listen-only mode. After the prepared remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during that time, please press star then the number one on your telephone keypad. This call is being recorded. Thank you very much. Mr. David Ometer of Investor Relations, you may now begin your conference. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to SNAP's first quarter 2019 earnings conference call. With us today are Evan Spiegel, Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder, Jeremy Gorman, Chief Business Officer, and Lara Sweet, Interim Chief Financial Officer. Earlier today, we made a slide presentation available that provides an overview of our user and financial metrics for the first quarter 2019, which can be found on our Investor Relations website at investor.snap.com. Now we'll cover the safe harbor. Today's call is to provide you with information regarding our first quarter 2019 performance in addition to our financial outlook. This conference call includes forward-looking statements. Any statement that refers to expectations, projections, guidance, or other characterizations of future events, including financial projections or future market conditions, is a forward-looking statement based on assumptions today. Actual results may differ materially from those expressed in these forward-looking statements, and we make no obligation to update our disclosures. For more information about factors that may cause actual results to differ materially from forward-looking statements, please refer to the press release we issued today, as well as risks described in our annual report on Form 10-K for the year ended December 31, 2018, particularly in the section titled Risk Factors. Additional information can be found in our other filings with the SEC when available. Our commentary today will also include non-GAAP financial measures, and we believe that the use of these non-GAAP financial measures provides an additional tool for investors to use in evaluating ongoing operating results and trends. These measures should not be considered in isolation from or as a substitute for financial information prepared in accordance with GAAP. Reconciliations between GAAP and non-GAAP metrics for our reported results can be found in our press release issued today, a copy of which can be found on our Investor Relations website. Please note that when we discuss all of our expense figures, they will exclude stock-based compensation and related payroll taxes, as well as depreciation and amortization and non-recurring charges. At times in our prepared remarks or in response to questions, we may offer additional metrics to provide greater insight into our business or our quarterly and annual results. This additional detail may be one time in nature, and we may or may not provide an update in the future on these metrics. Please refer to our filings with the SEC to understand how we calculate our metrics. With that, I'd like to turn the call over to Evan. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our call. We began the year with a solid first quarter, delivering strong results across our business with growth in daily active users, user engagement, and revenue. Our early momentum in the fiscal year is driven by our ability to innovate and execute on our mission to empower people to express themselves, live in the moment, learn about the world, and have fun together. We are excited to see the early results of some of the investments we made in 2018 and prior years. We added 4 million net additional users in the first quarter, growing our community to 190 million daily active users. We have achieved significant reach with millennials and Gen Z in key markets like the United States, where we now reach 75% of all 13 to 34-year-olds. As of March, our ads can now reach more 13 to 34-year-olds than Instagram in the United States. Our business generated revenues of $320 million in Q1, an increase of 39% year-over-year, and our year-over-year revenue growth increased by three percentage points versus the prior quarter. Our adjusted EBITDA loss in Q1 was $123 million, representing a 43% improvement year-over-year. This is the second consecutive quarter where more than 100% of our incremental year-over-year revenue flowed through to our bottom line. As of the end of Q1, our new Android application is available to everyone. Compared to the prior version, it is 25% smaller, opens 20% faster on average, and is modularized to allow for efficient, ongoing innovation. On some of the lowest performing devices, this resulted in a 6% increase in the number of people sending snaps within the first week of upgrading to the new Android build. While these early results are promising, improvements in performance and new user retention will take time to compound and meaningfully impact our top line metrics. There are billions of Android devices in the world that now have access to an improved Snapchat experience, and we look forward to being able to grow our Snapchat community in new markets. 
Following the expansion of our Discover platform with last year's redesign, we have been focused on broadening our content offerings and growing engagement. We now offer more than 450 premium content channels worldwide. We doubled the number of non-U.S. partners we work with in the past six months and launched over 50 new shows and publisher stories in international markets in Q1 alone. After seeing incredible engagement with Snap Originals, we will be launching 10 new original shows while also renewing some of last season's hit shows. The number of people watching Discover and their time spent watching content continue to grow as Discover becomes part of their daily routine. In Q1, nearly half of our daily Discover viewers watch Discover every day of the week. This growth and engagement is benefiting our content partners who have been able to reach a new audience on Snapchat. ESPN's Emmy-nominated Discover content added an incremental 13% to the total viewership across ESPN's U.S. mobile presence among people 13 and older in January, as measured by Comscore. In March, our partners increased their total mobile monthly reach in the U.S. by an average of more than 30% just by publishing to Discover, as measured by Comscore. Our augmented reality platform continues to evolve, with our community now spending more than 250 million minutes playing with AR experiences every day on average in the Snapchat camera. This represents a 10% increase in playtime per DAU compared to last year. With this growing engagement, we are also focusing on our growing community of lens creators as well as extending the capabilities of our AR platform. When we launched Lens Studio just over one year ago, a talented community of creators began creating and sharing AR experiences. Creators are now submitting thousands of new lenses on a daily basis, and lenses from our community are viewed hundreds of millions of times every day. We are constantly adding new functionality to Lens Studio, while also investing directly in our creator community. For example, we recently launched Creator Profiles, where creators can showcase their portfolios and build a following among our 190 million daily active users, more than three quarters of whom are engaging with AR on Snapchat every day. Augmented reality allows our Snapchat community to overlay their creativity on the world. We started by building augmented reality for selfies and then surfaces and are currently working on powering an even broader range of real-world interactions. With our new Landmarkers product, our camera can now interact directly with iconic buildings around the world, making it possible to land an ice dragon on top of the Flatiron Building in New York for the Game of Thrones premiere. With Scan, our camera can also recognize what it's looking at and deliver a contextually relevant experience. For example, our camera might surface pet-friendly lenses when you're scanning your dog or help you identify a particular product you are scanning to help you buy on Amazon. We recently launched Snap Games, which allows our community to play high-quality mobile games with their friends in real time through our chat service. This was the result of more than two years of investment to create a new way to have fun with your close friends. We worked with some amazing partners to build a platform focused on unique gaming experiences designed specifically for our platform and community with communication between friends and thoughtfully integrated monetization. We've been so excited to see the response from our community, and we can't wait to continue developing games. Our advertising business is continuing to scale following our transition to self-serve monetization, with nearly all of our products, including lenses, now available via our ads manager. We invested heavily in this platform over the past year, including launching dozens of new capabilities to deliver scalable ROI for an increasing variety of advertisers, including bid optimization for conversion events. This has helped us scale our direct response revenue, which more than doubled when compared to Q1 last year. Brand buyers are also seeing great results from our improvements over the past year. We now allow advertisers to optimize against important brand goals like efficient reach and targeting, which helps our vertical video and camera marketing products work together to deliver a brand narrative. We have also seen that our growing reach and engagement among millennials and Gen Z is an important differentiator in the marketplace. These generations are unprecedented in size and spending power, are still in the process of developing their brand loyalties, and are difficult to engage on other platforms or with traditional advertising formats. For example, Nestle recently ran a multi-product campaign for DiGiorno Pizza across Snap ads and filters, enabling them to deliver a comprehensive narrative across the different parts of our platform and allowing them to reach new buyers. One-third of incremental sales were driven by new buyers to the DiGiorno portfolio, 
as measured by Nielsen Catalina Solutions. This resulted in a 3.3% sales lift driven almost entirely by increased penetration and a 3.6x return on ad spend as measured by Nielsen Catalina Solutions. We are so excited to see advertisers achieve great results on Snapchat, and we are looking forward to continuing to improve our advertising products and platform. We have worked hard to thoughtfully balance our long-term investments in product innovation with operating cost discipline. The improvements we have made to our cost structure over the past year were largely due to efficiencies we found in our products and operations that outpaced our growing investments across our content, gaming, augmented reality, and advertising platforms. As we look towards the future, we see many opportunities to increase our investments, and we will continue to manage our business for long-term growth. Our team is energized by our progress and the many opportunities in front of us. We will continue to drive product innovation, enhance our advertising platform, and strengthen our team and business. With that, I'll turn the call over to Jeremy to talk more about our advertising business. Thanks, Evan. It's been a pleasure to be a part of SNAP for the past six months, and I'm thrilled to continue to work together with the rest of our leadership to build upon our strong foundation. We continue to see significant upside and opportunity in the future of our business. There are three primary drivers of our optimism. The first is our opportunity to scale the learnings from our successful brand partnerships across a wider variety of partners and industries. The second is our rapid progress with performance advertisers. And the third is the health of our advertising ecosystem, given the strength of our ad products and growing user engagement. First, we have been working closely with many large brand advertisers as we build out our ad platform and products, learning and iterating with them. And we've made major strides following our switch to a self-service platform. Over the past year, we've been building some of the best tools for brand marketers into Snap Ads Manager to enable them to achieve business results. For example, Advertisers can now buy our core ad products based on reach and frequency, which allows brand marketers the flexibility and customization of self-service tools with the transparency and predictability of reserve pricing. It has only been less than a year since we launched reach and frequency for lenses, and it is now the dominant way marketers are buying AR advertising on Snap. We see a significant opportunity to scale the learnings from this group of successful brand advertisers to a broader set of customers. For example, while we've seen success with a number of key QSR brands, there are remaining advertisers in the category with whom we could do more. And now, with the teams organized by vertical, these advertisers can be serviced by our team members with relevant categorical expertise. Like in this example, in order to fully realize these opportunities, we needed to set up a more scalable structure for our sales teams. As of April 1st, the reorganization has taken effect in the U.S and the international reorganization is underway as we speak. We have split the team into three segments to organize around advertiser needs. A significant portion of our U.S. revenue is transitioning between sales team members, and while we expect some disruption to our near-term business, we are confident that this is the right long-term structure. Our enterprise sales team is focused on large brand advertisers with complex buying structures and is now structured by vertical rather than by region. This allows our teams to share learnings across categories and gain expertise in the industries in which our advertisers operate, especially as these relationships and campaigns become increasingly sophisticated. Alongside this enterprise team is an emerging advertiser team focused primarily on direct response advertisers, such as app install and direct to consumer brands. This is a category seeing growing success on our platform. Lastly, our newly formed Scaled Services organization is focused on when-to-many marketing and sales tactics to continue to bring more and more advertisers to our platform. Overlaying this structure is a newly developed agency team to focus specifically on deepening our relationships with our agency partners. We're excited about these changes and the opportunities that come with them. This new structure will allow us to better drive adoption of some of the most engaging and innovative ad units in the industry. As Millennials and Gen Z are increasingly favoring short-form video and other rich mobile experiences over desktop and television, we are creating mobile ad units so that brands can reach our audience using these formats. Earlier this month, we announced a new slate of Snap Originals and our new Snap Games platform. Both of these products are monetized by commercials, our six-second, non-skippable mobile video product. We designed this specifically to work well for both our users 
and our advertising partners. Braden Anzuan, head of digital and innovation at Publicis and Mina, told us, quote, the launch of commercials on Snapchat answers the growing desire amongst brands to reach a mobile audience with compelling branded video content. Being the launch partner of this new format with our forward-thinking clients gave us a first view of its impact. We saw incredible results for BMW, Mini, Nestle, and Samsung locally, achieving really efficient CPM, CPCVs, and view-through rates." End quote. We continue to build on our industry-leading AR technology. Brands can now leverage our image recognition technology and location-enabled AR to immerse our community in an impactful content experience. For example, Nike and Foot Locker recently brought the House of Hoops to life by having LeBron James emerge from the wall to dunk, all inside our camera. On average, three quarters of our daily active users engage with AR experiences every day, and we're excited to partner with brands to bring even more AR experiences to our camera. We see an interesting opportunity at the intersection of our self-serve tools, our video ads, and our AR ads. Our ads manager empowers advertisers to run sophisticated campaigns that leverage multiple formats, helping brands tell a cohesive story across our service. Combining our optimization and delivery capabilities with formats native to the Snapchat generation allows our products to work better together and delivers compelling storytelling at scale. For example, Toyota ran a sophisticated campaign across our various video and AR products to promote the Corolla hatchback amongst millennials. Snapchatters engage with the ads, watching more than 90% of their commercials on average and playing with their lens for more than 10 seconds each on average. By combining different video and AR experiences in an optimized and efficient way, Toyota was able to deliver a rich narrative that led Snapchatters 25 and older who saw the ads to be 40% more likely to identify the car as having the particular brand attributes the ads were designed to promote as measured by Kantar. Second, we've made remarkable progress with performance advertisers and our direct response platform generally. In less than two years, we built a self-service ad platform from scratch that is nearly at feature parity with industry leaders on things like targeting and delivery capabilities. That's why Wish, one of the most sophisticated e-commerce advertisers, is seeing success with our newest formats, such as a 75% lower cost per install when leveraging our new app install optimization capabilities and an even lower cost per install when using our new shoppable catalog ad format. Additionally, our progress in this area allowed us to increase the volume of always-on performance advertisers that are not as affected by seasonal brand advertising trends, with our total direct response revenue more than doubling year over year. Advanced DR advertisers such as Pocket Gems, makers of the popular mobile game episode, have seen improved return on ad spend on our platform over time. For instance, in Q1, our app install ads drove 300% more purchase volume inside episode as compared to Q1 2018. We continue to learn alongside close partners like Pocket Gems, improving measurement, optimization, and relevance to drive stronger downstream results for performance-oriented campaigns. Lastly, while our advertising business is still young, it is powered by very strong underlying fundamentals, including a hard-to-reach audience with high-quality engagement and auction dynamics to drive better results as we scale our business. We have high penetration among a valuable and growing audience who engages heavily with both premium mobile video and interactive AR every day in Snapchat. With demographic and behavioral trends pointing in our favor, we are increasing inventory within our ad products, such as high quality shows and games, which have the potential to attract incremental online video budgets into our hand curated brand safe environment. We also have a lot of opportunities to improve and expand our business. Our advertising products and self-service platform have proven to deliver ROI at scale with a lot of headroom for continued improvement. In the past year alone, we introduced several new capabilities, from lower funnel bidding optimizations for downstream events like website and in-app purchases, to innovative new ad formats like story ads, commercials, and AR lenses with direct response attachments. We are also expanding existing self-service products for camera advertising to bring the benefits of optimization and scale to even more of our ad products. As these improvements have given advertisers of all types and sizes the capacity to win on Snap, we also have opportunities to not only deepen our relationships with the world's largest companies, but also expand into new industries, geographies, and advertiser types 
to increase the overall advertiser breadth and depth on the platform. Furthermore, trends in our business also point to auction dynamics that can drive both growth and performance. This past year has demonstrated that we're able to grow our advertiser base and revenue while simultaneously decreasing average cost per conversion for our advertisers, showing how our ongoing improvements in our efficiency and optimization have plenty of room to flow through to deliver better results at a larger scale. We also recently announced the upcoming SNAP audience network, which will allow us to help our publisher and advertiser partners reach their customers in a variety of environments in a privacy safe way. This will be a long-term investment and we're getting started with a few select partners. We're committed to our advertisers' success in every way possible, and the results of the past few quarters show this. I feel so fortunate to be here at this fantastic moment in SNAP's history, and I'm confident that there's an incredible amount of opportunity ahead of us. With that, I'd like to turn the call over to Lara. Thanks, Jeremy. Our Q1 2019 financial results reflect our continued focus on driving growth, revenue, and long-term operational efficiencies. Our Q1 2019 operating cash flow improved $166 million to negative $66 million compared with Q1 2018 and improved $60 million compared with Q4 2018. The year-over-year -year change in operating cash flow is driven by a $94 million improvement in adjusted EBITDA offset by changes in the timing of working capital. Similarly, the sequential change in operating cash flow is driven by changes in the timing of working capital, reflecting the seasonality of our business between Q4 and Q1, partially offset by a $73 million decline in adjusted EBITDA. Our capital expenditures, which are nominal, are mainly associated with the build-out of our office facilities. Q1 2019 capital expenditures were $12 million compared to $36 million in Q1 2018, and $23 million in the prior quarter. Our Q1 2019 free cash flow improved $190 million to negative $78 million compared with Q1 2018 and improved $71 million compared with Q4 2018. Common shares outstanding plus shares underlying stock-based awards outstanding totaled $1,544 million on March 31, 2019 compared with $1,457 million a year ago. We ended the quarter with $1.2 billion of cash and marketable securities. Our change in cash for the quarter was negative $70 million. The change in cash was $151 million better than the prior year and improved $65 million versus the prior quarter as we continue to make progress towards generating free cash flow. For the quarter, we generated record Q1 revenue of $320 million, an increase of 39% year-over-year, and a decrease of 18% sequentially, reflecting the expected seasonality in our business from Q4 to Q1. Daily active users were $190 million in Q1 2019, compared to $191 million in Q1 2018, and $186 million in Q4 2018. Our results in Q1 benefited from positive momentum at the beginning of the quarter due to seasonality that we observed as a result of the holiday season. Average revenue per user was $1.68, an increase of 39% year-over-year, and a decrease of 19% sequentially, again reflecting seasonality in our business. In Q1 2019, North America ARPU increased 34% year-over-year, compared to a 23% year-over-year increase in Q4 2018 and a 16% year-over-year increase in Q1 2018. In terms of our advertising business, total impressions were up 155% year-over-year and 6% sequentially, while pricing was down 42% year-over-year and was down 22% sequentially. The price decrease was driven primarily by an increase in available supply. Infrastructure costs per daily active user were $0.72 cents in Q1 2019, down from $0.73 cents in Q1 2018, and flat sequentially. We have maintained our focus on unit cost efficiencies while growing daily active users by $4 million quarter over quarter. Our cloud infrastructure costs moving forward are expected to be driven by three primary factors. The first is the size of our community 
and the depth of engagement per user of our application. If engagement trends continue in a positive direction, we expect to observe higher infrastructure costs despite improving unit cost for the underlying cloud services and user actions. The second factor is the cost structure of our cloud partners, where we continue to benefit from their growing economies of scale, which are passed on to us in the form of lower rates. The third factor is how efficiently we utilize our cloud infrastructure. On this last front, we are seeing continuous improvements in the unit cost of delivering various services to our users, including, for example, the cost to serve an advertising impression and the cost to deliver a SNAP. In addition to infrastructure costs, the remainder of cost of revenue is primarily made up of content costs and payments to third-party ad sellers, which declined 11% sequentially and increased 10% year-over-year, primarily due to seasonality in our business. Gross margin expanded substantially year-over-year, year, which continues to demonstrate that our business model is scaling profitably. Gross margin was 39%, improving over 2,100 basis points year-over-year, year, although gross margin declined by 900 basis points sequentially, again reflecting the seasonal nature of our business. Operating expenses in the quarter were $248 million, down 4% year-over-year and up 4% sequentially. We continue to focus on driving operating cost productivity across our business. Our operating expenses are primarily driven by employee-related costs, which represent about two-thirds of our operating expenses. We continue to see fixed cost leverage and employee-related costs, which declined 2% year-over-year and were up 4% sequentially. Operating expenses as a percentage of revenue were 77% compared with 112% in Q1 2018 and 61% in Q4 2018. Q1 2019 adjusted EBITDA was negative $123 million, an improvement of $94 million over the prior year and a decline of $73 million over the prior quarter. This was the fourth consecutive quarter that we had an improvement in year-over-year -year adjusted EBITDA. Adjusted EBITDA margin for Q1 2019 improved significantly year-over-year -year to negative 39% compared with negative 94% in Q1 2018. Adjusted EBITDA leverage was 105% in the quarter, compared to 104% in the prior quarter. Finally, Q1 operating loss improved 76 million over the prior year to negative 316 million. Our Q1 operating loss increased 121 million over the prior quarter. With respect to the second quarter of 2019, the positive trends we are observing in per-user engagement may increase our infrastructure cost overall. Additionally, as Evan mentioned earlier, we plan to make additional investments in marketing, content, engineering, and sales to support our long-term strategic objectives and to build on the momentum we see in our business today. We believe that these investments will create value over the long term but in the immediate term, they will put downward pressure on the very high operating leverage we have observed in recent quarters. These forward-looking statements reflect our expectations as of April 23, 2019, and are subject to substantial uncertainty. As mentioned at the start of the call, our results are inherently unpredictable and may be materially affected by many factors. Now I'll share our Q2 2019 outlook. Revenue is expected to be between $335 million and $360 million, or to grow between 28% and 37% year-over-year, compared to $262 million in Q2 2018. Adjusted EBITDA is expected to be between negative $150 million and negative $125 million, compared to negative $169 million in Q2 2018. This guidance assumes, among other things, that no business acquisitions, investments, restructurings, or legal settlements are concluded in the quarter. While we are not going to give specific guidance on daily active users, we have previously seen stronger daily active user growth rates in Q1 when compared to Q2. With that, let's open up the line for questions. And that concludes the prepared remarks for today's earnings call, and we will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then 1 on your touchtone phone. 
If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. In the interest of time, we do ask that you please limit yourself to one question. After your initial question is asked, your line will be muted. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. And today's first questioner will be Ross Sandler with Barclays. Please go ahead. Great, thanks. Uh, Edwin, just a question on the, uh, the DAU commentary for, uh, for 2Q. Uh, so you just mentioned in the prepared remarks that uh, the growth rate will be lower than 1Q. I assume you guys are referring to the 2% sequential growth that you just realized in the first quarter uh, in, in terms of it being lower than that, but just a clarification would be helpful. And then I guess big picture, uh, when do you see SNAP getting back to the cadence of DAU growth that you had kind of pre-redesign now that Android is, is fully rolled out? And is, is Android at this point growing month over month? Any color would be helpful on that. Thank you. Hi, Ross. This is Lara. Um, and I, thanks for the question. I, I think to be clear, uh, as you pointed out, we were talking about our sequential growth rates. So we've previously seen stronger quarter over quarter daily active user growth rates in Q1 when compared with Q2. You know, additionally, as we look out, we don't provide guidance outside of um, what we've reflected in Q2. And our assumptions on DAU are reflected in our guidance on revenue and adjusted EBITDA. Um, and, you know, we think that as we're rolling out um, the early results on Android, on Android excuse me, are promising. Um, improvements in performance and new user retention take time to compound and meaningfully, meaningfully impact our top line metrics. And our next questioner today will be Heath Terry with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Great, thanks. Um, Evan, I know you touched on it a little bit in the, um, uh, in the, the remarks, but um, uh, any uh, deeper um, uh, discussion you want to have around the the initial returns that you're seeing on um, uh, on the Android app uh, levels of engagement um, geogra geography uh, in terms of where that's where that's showing sort of the most the most benefit um, and then it, from an, on an advertising revenue side of things as you think about benchmarking yourself versus your peers when you when you look at the mix that you've got you know whether it's brand versus direct response or uh, self-serve versus direct sales. Is there a um, uh, particular opportunity or gap there that you're more focused on in, in terms of uh, in terms of closing? Maybe that's a, a better question for Jeremy, but um, uh, appreciate any uh, any thoughts you have. Hey, thanks for the questions. Uh, I'll let Jeremy handle the second one. Uh, you know, as it pertains to Android, we're definitely excited by what we're seeing. You know, we talked about the improvements, uh, especially on resource-constrained devices, which is really exciting for us because that opens up a new uh, market opportunity uh, from for folks who really uh, weren't able to use Snapchat, uh, you know, as effectively uh, in the past. So. Uh, excited about what we're seeing. I can't provide any specifics beyond uh, what we shared uh, earlier, but uh, you know it's early, and I think really uh, for us this is sort of the, the price of admission to international markets. So I think the next chapter is really going to be about localizing our content experiences, our augmented reality experiences, things like that, as we look to grow internationally. And thanks. I'll take the second part of the question. Uh, parts of what have driven the strong, uh, strong results for this quarter have been performance advertisers who've more than doubled, doubled their spend year over year in Q1. Um, this followed uh, the launch of our lower funnel tools in the past year, such as goal-based bidding for in-app conversions and pixel events. Um, we're very pleased that we've also seen growth from brand advertisers as we continue to iterate on the ad product ecosystem uh, specific to reach and frequency lenses that are available, our commercials format, which is the full screen unskippable video format that's in brand safe environments, which are really strong for brand advertisers. So we're seeing strong growth in both segments and expect that to continue. And the next questioner today will be Rich Greenfield with BTIG. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking the questions. I've got a few. First, you know, Evan, at the partner day, you kind of talked about gaming being what you thought was kind of the most exciting part of the series of announcements. Was hoping you could elaborate for everyone listening kind of why gaming is so important to Snapchat. Is it more about engagement, revenues, or both? Two, ad kit. I think Jeremy mentioned um, this, you know, I know it was kind of a new announcement at, at the partner day. 
any partners yet or any third-party platform or any third-party mobile apps using AdKit and actually using your ads anywhere yet, and how should we think about the timing of that? And then just lastly on the, the Android rollout, obviously you've had a lot of people for the last few years that have been kind of frustrated with Snapchat on Android, which is why you rebuilt it. Um, while in markets like India where you're a new launch, I, I don't assume you need a win-back campaign, but in markets like Europe where people may have been frustrated, what's your plan for kind of helping tell people that there's a new rebuilt app and a much better experience? Like what's that marketing strategy look like over the next several months? Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Rich, for the questions. Uh, you know, as, as it pertains to gaming, I think what's, what's great about uh, the gaming platform is that it really leverages the unique attributes of Snapchat to bring friends together. Um, so I, th I think what we're excited about over the long term is that it may create more monetization opportunities around the communication side of our business. Um, but, you know, it's very early, and uh, we're, we're excited by the enthusiasm around that platform. So that'll be, that'll be great. And then I think, you know, as it pertains to Android and, and sort of the, the win back, it, it's going to take time to rebuild that trust. Uh, you know, and I think the best way for us to do that is really to deliver on the product, uh, continue our pace of innovation on Android, and, and deliver those improvements over time. We're, of course, supplementing that with marketing and, you know, other sort of in-market activities, um, but, but I think uh, that it's going to be a process. And I'll jump in on the ad kit question, Rich. Thank you for the question. Uh, the ad kit has not launched yet for the SNAP Audience Network. It's a long-term strategy um, and still obviously very early days. We just announced it a couple of weeks ago. Um, but we're really excited by the response from publishers who want to work with us and our ad partners on connecting with our hard-to-reach audience while they spend time outside of Snapchat. Um, we're growing the list of partners deliberately, and we're going to have more to share in the months to come. But it is we don't expect it to have a material impact on revenue in 2019 as we're making this a very deliberate long-term strategy for the business. And our next questioner today will be Justin Post with Merrill Lynch. Please go ahead. Great. In the prepared remarks, you talked about engagement up. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about what people are really growing uh, on Snapchat. Is it Discover? Is it other areas? And uh, any, any impact on total time spent? And then secondly, related to that, impressions were up 155%. Uh, where are you serving the majority of those new ad impressions? And uh, uh, are, are those the yields to advertisers is good, good with those new impressions? Thank you. So on the engagement growth, uh, we're really seeing it across the board. You know, we've shared uh, the time spent remains over uh, 30 minutes uh, per user per day. Uh, so really excited about that. Um, and I think there, there's lots of opportunity to grow on the content side of the business, but also uh, with our augmented reality products and communication. And then as far as the diversification of where we run our advertising, we're very fortunate to continue to have these innovative areas such as games um, and the forthcoming audience network, of course. As we continue to grow DAU, there are more opportunities to show more ads, more story ads, for instance. Um, and then with the commercial format, that runs in Discover and across games. And as we start to see increased engagement in those two areas, we have more opportunities to show more ads to our Snapchat community without impacting their experience. And our next questioner today will be Lloyd Walmsley with Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Yeah, great. I have two if I can. Uh, first, uh, Jeremy, a lot, lot of changes to the sales force with some verticalization, some emerging ad team, the agency team. Can you kind of rank order the most interesting opportunity to drive revenue in the next year or two and talk about maybe how, how conversations with advertisers have been changing? Uh, and then second one, you know, kind of related to this, it seems like most of the focus right now is around performance advertisers. Um, you said performance ad spend doubled, and assuming that's the majority of ad spend, it implies kind of a flattish or, or decline in brand, brand spend. Um, I don't know if, if, if that's really the right, if you're really over half on performance, but if you can give us a sense of mix and then how the brand spend has trended and kind of where, where the focus is there. Thanks. Thanks for the questions, Lloyd. Um, I will answer them in generally reverse order. Uh, we just started our performance advertising business about a year ago, so the growth trends do not imply a decline in brand spend. It's just newer so that it's growing more quickly. Um, as it pertains to the sales reorganization in particular, um, I'm actually really excited about the split because uh, if you look at it in segments specifically to the enterprise customers, what our sales team used to have was a list of somewhere between 62, 
100 advertisers on whom they were calling. Um, we've shrunk that list in the enterprise world, allowing them to go much more deep with the advertisers they service. Um, and then it's consistent across industries as well. So everyone who calls on QSR, for instance, across the whole country um, rolls up into the same manager. In terms of the em emerging pieces, because we were seeing such high growth specific to app install as well as direct to consumer, for example, we've grouped those together so that we have people like optimization experts that are focused on those kinds of clients that require a different level of service. Um, so really what we've done is organize the team ag against advertiser needs, uh, very specific to how they'd like to be serviced. Some want to have more optimization specialists, some want to have more white glove service as their advertising mix becomes more sophisticated. Uh, so I'm excited about all of it, um, so it would be hard to rank order them uh, in terms of the most interesting, but the horizontal, the making the business both horizontal and vertical, we expect to yield dividends for, for years to come. We feel it's a very durable structure. And our next questioner today will be Mark Mahaney with RBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks. Just some color, please, on the DAU growth in the March quarter. I think last quarter you provided a little bit of color on how much of the growth uh, came from iOS versus Android. Could you do that for the March quarter? Secondly, could you talk a little bit about uh, if you've, the success you've had in expanding the demographic appeal above the 34-year age, 34-year-old uh, age uh, um, cut off or whatever it is. I know there's a few of us above there. And then third, uh, in the Q2, uh, in these investments that you're making in the, in the June quarter, is it just an increase in magnitude of investments in these areas, marketing, engineering, content, and sales, or are there uh, new areas that you've not invested in before that you plan to invest in now? Just talk about whether it's qualitative or quantitative increase. Thank you. Uh, thanks. I'll take the uh, two of those questions. One, um, we're not breaking out our iOS versus Android expectations as it relates to DAU. Um, and then similarly, as we look at our investments, these are things that we are continuing to invest in. Uh, we always have a focus on driving growth and innovation in our business, and our Q2 guidance reflects our continuation of that. Mark, I think as we look at uh, expanding our audience, we're most focused today on the international audience that's 13 to 34. We know that our product really resonates with our core demo. We're going to focus our efforts there. And I think, you know, the age-up strategy is a longer-term strategy for us and will, you know, require more investments in terms of content and augmented reality experiences that appeal uh, to that demographic. Um, but that's something that we're, that we're certainly working on. The next questioner today will be John Egbert with Stiefel. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks. Uh, I know it's extremely early, but I'm wondering if you can share any early learnings from user behavior on the games platform, whether it's behavior you've observed directly or feedback you've gotten from your developer partners. And I'm sure it'll differ by game, um, and you might have a very, very uh, broad group of different types of games eventually. But in general, is there a meaningful difference in infrastructure costs for real-time games relative to other forms of content consumption on Snapchat? Uh, you know, we don't provide the breakout of how we look at the um, cost per engagement uh, across, you know, our various forms of content. As we look forward into Q2, we do see that the positive trends that we're observing overall and per user engagement may increase our infrastructure costs overall. And the next questioner today will be Eric Sheridan with UBS. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking the question. Um, maybe a little bit of color on the uh, increased success you've had on the direct response side. Can you give us a little bit of color about how direct response advertisers might be trending year on year from a budget standpoint, or what's driving more success in the direct response side? Is it depth of advertisers in the auction as you continue to widen out depth, uh, or is it upward price uh, from the auction dynamic. Just want a little bit of more color on what's driving the growth, uh, both in terms of the mix uh, and on the advertiser side and direct response. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks for the question, Eric. Um, there are a couple of reasons that we're seeing so much success. Um, it is all of, uh, most of those things, it's an increased number of active ad accounts. In fact, the number of active ad accounts is higher than it has ever been in our history. Um, we are seeing increased budgets. We're seeing success in app install, and we are seeing success in commerce as we continue to iterate on the ad products, such as catalogs, that allow advertisers like Wish to find success in their direct response advertising. And at the end of the day, we believe that our innovative mobile-first ad formats provide both brand and DR advertisers an opportunity to reach their customers at scale in an engaging way and still believe there's significant upside. 
And our next questioner today will be Mark May with Citi. Please go ahead. Mark May, your line is open for questions. Okay, moving on, our next questioner today will be John Blackledge. Oh, go ahead, sir. Hi, sorry about that. Uh, I mean, in terms of your philosophy around balancing growth and profitability, and this is kind of ties into your prepared remarks regarding operating leverage going forward, how are you thinking about, uh, you know, uh, delivering on your stretch goal, I think it was, of EBITDA break-even this year, and just in general around uh, delivering on in improvements in uh, margins and, and EBITDA, say, over the next, uh, you know, year. So, thanks. Thanks for the question. Yeah, I, I think as we look uh, at our progress over the last year or so, uh, we've really been able to hold our cost structure roughly flat uh, for more than a year. And I think as we look forward, you know, this is our second quarter of more than 100% incremental flow through on year over year incremental revenue. And so I think uh, as, we're, as we're looking at the growth opportunities in front of us, not only will you know increasing engagement translate to higher infrastructure costs, but we also see more opportunities to invest, uh, you know, in our content business, our augmented reality business, uh, and more. So I think uh, you know, just as we look to the future, we're we're of course going to do our best to balance, uh, you know, uh, our operating efficiency along with our long-term investments. But we see a lot of opportunities right now, and we want to make sure we're doing the right thing for the long term. And the next questioner today will be John Blackledge with Cohen. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you. With the uh, sales reorg, uh, you mentioned some disruption to the near-term business. Could you discuss that a little bit more broadly, um, how long it might persist, and also perhaps quantify or give a range of the impact? Um, the second question is uh, on user engagement. Definitely appears strong, you, you know, despite rising ad loads over the past year or so. How do you feel uh, about your ability to, to continue to raise ad load um, over the near and intermediate term? Thank you. Hey, John, thanks for the question. This is Jeremy. I will ask the, answer the first part and then turn it over to Lara. Uh, regarding the sales reorg, SNAP, like any other organization, um, has some potential uh, disruption when you do a reorganization, nothing particularly acute to us, um, but just general general sentiment when you do a reorganization. Uh, that is reflected in our guidance, uh, though thus far we've mitigated uh, as many risks as we possibly can um, with with revenue changing hands or clients changing hands. Uh, an example of that would be that if an account was turning over from an account executive to a different account executive with whom that client hadn't worked, we had a month overlap with that advertiser in March between the two teams to ensure continuity of service. Um, and we put another a number of other uh, mitigating risk factors in there as well. Um, so nothing specific to us, but just general um, general disruption as things change hands. And that is, again, reflected in our guidance. I'll turn it to Lara for the second part. Great. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, and you know, I think as it relates to that as well, uh, as Jeremy mentioned, we did factor that into our guidance as these are inherently disruptive events. Um, when we look at our ad load broadly, when we looked at Q1, um, we consistently increased supply while monitoring the effect on users. This allowed more and more brand and performance advertisers to achieve return on investment and see success with our growing suite of ad products. And we expect this result will increase uh, demand going forward. You know, additionally, our monetization efforts always keep the user experience top of mind, which is why we're focused on optimization and providing the most relevant ads to our users. Healthy engagement from our community is important as an increased engagement opens up available ad inventory, as do features like new originals and games. The next questioner today will be Doug Anmuth with J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking the questions. Um, Jeremy, I was hoping you could just talk a little bit about your efforts to improve um, the onboarding of advertisers, um, how you might be doing that faster now. Um, and then, Lara, uh, you talked a little bit about some of those investment areas um, where you're going to pick up the spend here. The cloud part was was pretty clear. Um, I was just hoping you could talk more on kind of marketing, content, sales, um, if there's anything else to call out in those areas. Thanks. 
Sure thing, Doug. Thanks for the question. Um, we're making a couple of different changes on both the product side as well as on the sales side to onboard new advertisers. Right now, the sophisticated advertisers, those who have been buying advertising for a long time, have a really easy time utilizing our ads manager as the features are nearly at parity with the rest of the industry. However, for smaller businesses, we know that we need to uh, we need to change the tools a bit to make them a little bit easier, a little bit more automated and simple for smaller advertisers to use. So we're in the process of evaluating those changes and making some of those to activate more advertisers in the tail. Um, to coincide with that, we've also formed the scaled services team whose job is to focus on one-to-many marketing and sales tactics, um, such as email marketing and a proper CRM system to guide them through the process to get them onboarded and to ensure that their churn rate stays low so that we can get more and more advertisers into the ecosystem, ultimately impacting our auction dynamics in a favorable way. Great, and I'll take the next part. Um, if you look at over the time, the improvements we've made in our cost structure over the past year were largely due to efficiencies we found in our products and ops. These outpaced our growing investments across content, gaming, augmented reality, and our ad platforms. So as we're looking forward and building on the momentum of the business, that's where we're fo really focusing on areas to be able to invest in marketing, content, engineering, and sales so that we're providing you know, more opportunities for our community to deeply engage with our app, as well as um, factors like Jeremy mentioned, the creation of the emerging sales team, which allows us to reach new advertisers at scale. Um, we plan to do this um, through things like in targeted investments in people that will really support our long-term strategic objectives. And the next questioner today will be Brian Nowak with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking my question. You've made a, uh, a series of improvements to the overall ad process, the self-serve tools, the reorg, uh, Salesforce, video ads, et cetera. Could you maybe just sort of talk about the one or two biggest hurdles you're still encountering with branded advertisers to really get them to spend more on the platform? It seems like performance is coming. What's the one or two biggest improvements you have to make to really start to crack the brands more? Thanks for the question, Brian. Um, we are the. I, I would say the number one hurdle is that our ad formats are different than you would traditionally see on desktop, television, or even other digital. Um, so that's not assets that everybody necessarily has at their disposal. When you think of a six-second unskippable vertical video, for instance, that's not something that everybody just has on hand. Um, the good news is that we are working very closely with the product team who has been working very hard to help our advertisers create these assets in an automated and simple and scalable way so that more advertisers can advertise on our platform. Um, additionally, as these formats, vertical video, vertical uh, still images become more and more common across the overall advertising ecosystem outside of SNAP, we suspect that that will have and mean that other people have these assets at their disposal and that become less of a hurdle for us. Uh, but we remain focused on improving the ad product suite. We're investing in relevance, optimization, and measurement um, and, and, and these innovative ad formats to continue. But I would say that that is probably our number one hurdle for onboarding. The next questioner today will be Michael Nathanson with Moffitt Nathanson. Please go ahead. Thanks. I have one for Jeremy, one for Laura. For Laura. Jeremy, in answering that question of Brian's, one of the bull case you know, ideas is perhaps the category of, of digital ads on Snap is going to grow because of Instagram's push into stories. So is there any way you could help us understand if has Instagram stories push maybe you know, made it easier for you to kind of transition people to a, a different type of format? Is there anything you could share on that? I would say unspecific to Instagram, but the adoption of the vertical stories format generally across um, the app ecosystem will help us. Um, again, kind of referring to my previous answer, the more advertisers that have that asset, the more easy it is for us to onboard those advertisers into Snap. Um, so we view that as, as success for the entirety of the industry and how people naturally hold their phones native to this generation. And the next questioner today will be Anthony DiClemente with Evercore. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks, maybe for Jeremy. One thing I'm curious about um, on premium publisher revenue, so a number of points in the prepared remarks about how well Discover is doing in terms of growing engagement and viewership with Discover. Um, you know, assuming a lot of that is premium publisher content, 
um, you know, it seems like at the same time you've done a great job controlling revenue share costs. If you just look at the slide that shows um, the composition of cost of revenue, I think those are up nine percent. So, so you know, staying relatively in check. So, can you just help me think about how do those content agreements and revenue share costs work? Like, why shouldn't we expect um, uh, premium publisher costs related to Discover? Um, expect those to start to pick up or um, you know is are we am I thinking about that the right way in other words um, how do those kind of flow through the income statement those agreements and how do you see them uh, trending going forward thanks this is a uh, Lara I'll actually take that one um, I think that the health of our relationship with our content partners and our content ecosystem is very important to us and as we talked about one of the areas that we're focusing on investing in is our content area and these expectations are factored into our guidance for Q2 um, and I think additionally as we look at the um, P&L we don't go into details on how we structure these arrangements um, but as you know from a, um, a an actual income statement standpoint our cost of revenue is reflected um, includes our rev share as well as our infrastructure cost. And the next questioner today will be Brent Phil with Jeffries. Please go ahead. Laura, on, on pricing, it, it's, it's gotten better, but you were down 42% in Q1, down 65 in Q1 last year. At, at what point do you, you start to see improvements? Is, is that back half of the year from your perspective? Uh, you know, price is not an outcome we seek to drive in the short term. Our focus has always been on building a healthy marketplace that ensures advertisers continue to achieve the best outcomes while maximizing ROI. Um, in Q1, on the supply side, we steadily rolled out new ad products and placements, and this captured the growing engagement on our service while monitoring the effect on users. More and more advertisers are then able to come in, achieve return on investment, see success with our ad products, and we think this is actually going to increase demand going forward. So while we believe this is healthy for our business in the long term, it causes downward pressure on our pricing. Um, and also as a remand, reminder, excuse me, for the demand side, our self-serve tools are less than two years old, so demand is still early, and we continue to see meaningful growth. And the next questioner today will be Ron Josie with JMP Securities. Please go ahead. Great. Thanks for taking the question. Jeremy, just wanted to follow up on something you talked about, an interesting opportunity at the intersection of self-serve video and AR. And just maybe understand that a little bit more, just given how the market has really been um, adopting video and AR together. Thank you. Sure. Thanks for the question, Ron. Um, I think that it's a fascinating intersection because we see that when advertisers use the entirety of our product suite, or at least more than just one particular piece, that their outcomes are better um, as specific to their KPIs. Um, so when we see people utilize lenses, stories, and snap ads, for instance, together in a campaign, those results come out better, um, and I think that, and that's what I was referring to when I was talking about the intersection. In addition, we've moved things like our lens product into the auction, into the self-service format, where advertisers can now bid via things like reach and frequency, for instance. Um, so where lenses used to be available only on a per day basis, now, they're ba uh, now they can be bought on an audience basis, allowing more advertisers of all types to use our creative tools to drive performance. Our next questioner today will be Yusef Squally with SunTrust. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you very much. Two quick questions, please. Can you speak to your performance uh, across geos? Looks like North America did really well. Europe and the rest of the world did a little less well. Anything to call out there? And then from your early observations, um, how do you think monetization on Android will compare to that of iOS? Is there anything structural that should actually justify a, a delta between the two? Thank you. This is Lara, and thanks for the question. Um, you know, North America growth accelerated 34% year over year versus 23% last quarter. We think a lot of the reason for this acceleration was strong advertiser trends in North America and increased spend from those brand and performance advertisers despite seasonality. We believe there's still a large opportunity with both brand and performance businesses in the U.S. and internationally. So as you look at that, um, Europe next in that bucket really lagged North America in the shift to self-serve, so the impacts are more pronounced in our year-over-year -year revenue and ARPU trends, whereas rest of world started on the auction. And so we're able to begin monetize, monetizing those markets quickly, um, and you see you know, results of that in our rest of world, including areas like the Middle East. 
I think as it pertains to the monetization opportunity on Android versus iOS, we don't break out the uh, difference there, but I would say that, you know, as Android uh, engagement increases, we believe the, the revenue opportunity will increase as well. And our last questioner for today will be Ray Stokel with Consumer Edge Research. Please go ahead. Great. Thanks so much for taking my question. All sort of related to gaming, but could, could involve things that are non-gaming related. What does rewarded advertising add to your capabilities, and what feedback are you getting from advertisers so far? And then how important would in-app purchases be over time to success in rewarded advertising? And then big picture across gaming and non-gaming, how big could in-app purchases be as a portion of sales in, let's say, three to five years? Thanks. Thanks for the question. Yeah, you know, our uh, our rewarded video products built on top of commercials, and that product is seeing, uh, I think, a lot of uptake in the marketplace. Uh, it's a six-second non-skippable unit uh, premium video, uh, and that's been really well received by advertisers. So we're expanding that inventory uh, with our rewarded uh, video units in, in gaming. Uh, I can't speak to the broader sort of in-app purchase opportunity, um, but it's certainly something we're looking at. And this will conclude our question and answer session, as well as SNAP Inc.'s first quarter 2019 earnings conference call. just want to thank you all for attending today's presentation, and you may now disconnect your lines.